Hello, and welcome to the Technology, Risk and Gambling webinar series. I'm Sally Gainsbury. I'm Professor in the School of Psychology at the University of Sydney, and I'm Director of the Gambling Treatment and Research Clinic at the Brain and Mind Centre, who are hosting this webinar series. Today is that the last set webinar series uh, for season three for a little while, although we're taking a pause we do intend to come back, don't worry. Um, but we're very happy to have uh, an excellent lineup and really taking advantage of the breadth of the topics and the breadth of the expertise of speakers. We're going to be talking about today, really more focusing on some of the online and currency and finance and illegal betting markets. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat early on. Sometimes we get a flurry of questions at the end that we don't have time to get through. So take advantage of the expertise of the speakers today. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to the co-host, Dr. Khalil Philander. Well, thank you very much, Sally. I appreciate the introduction. My name is Khalil Philander. I'm an assistant professor at Washington State University. Um, and welcome everybody to another ERG seminar series. This week we have three excellent guests who are going to be taking us through um, a few overlapping and a few sort of orthogonal tangential issues around um, kind of broadly crime and betting, crime and wagering. Um, and so on our panel today we have first um, Martin Perdrick, who's a consultant, writer, and analyst who specializes in Asia organized crime. Also Tom Chignell, who's at the Hong Kong Jockey Club, where he's the executive uh, manager of racing integrity and betting analysis. And also joining us is Dr. John Langsdale, who is at Macquarie University and studies um, international money laundering and financial crime. So thank you, all three of you, for joining us today. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, so uh, as was suggested um, by uh, the panel, because there are some uh, overlapping, but also some uh, tangential things that everybody's a specialist in. We thought that it would be a, a good idea to have each person uh, take a couple of minutes and tell us a little bit about their backgrounds and the issues that they focus on. Um, so with that in mind, I might hand the conversation over to Martin first, um, if you wouldn't mind uh, just sharing with us a little bit of uh, your background and, and the types of things you're interested in in this space. Yeah, Khalil, thank you very much. And, and Sally, thank you very much for the introdu introduction as well. Um, so I think I think that makes me the the icebreaker um, for uh, for the webinar, which uh, which is a nice position to be in. Um, as as uh, you gave quite a brief introduction, um, just to explain to people who I am, what I do. Yes, I'm a consultant um, and an analyst at the moment, but uh, Having left Asia after 32 years working there in um, mostly corporate security, corporate risk roles, uh, originally in the Royal Hong Kong Police, but that was a very long time ago. Um, and, and for the last uh, 11 years in the um, Hong Kong Jockey Club, um, managing a range of risk issues. But one of the things we focused on a great deal was, um, was integrity. Uh, in fact, integrity was in my job title. And, um, and integrity was was in the name of the department that I managed as well. So integrity in horse racing is is critical, just as integrity in any sport is critical, because obviously, if you don't have integrity, then people won't watch the sport. Uh, it's as simple as that. And um, it doesn't become a competition that they can enjoy and get excited about a fair outcome. Um, there are some actually good examples over the over the decades of um, of sports that have suffered from declining integrity and then and then seeing their fan base disappear a particularly good one is uh, is baseball in taiwan i think in the 1980s when when there was so much corruption in baseball in taiwan that uh, that the fan base and the attendance at games just dropped off a cliff uh, and it took them another decade at least to get that back so so integrity anti-corruption, fairness in sport is absolutely critical. And, and one of the things we studied over the years in Hong Kong um, in relation to that was obviously betting on horse racing and betting on other sports, uh, because betting is usually or, or, or often one of the drivers of corruption in racing and sports. And, and just to step back from that for a moment, obviously, um, doping of horses and people is is an issue globally and it has been 
for many decades as well. But um, but usually there are reasons for doping, uh, certainly in horse racing, either to to make a horse go slower or to make a horse go faster. Quite simple and much the same for people, usually to go faster, obviously, with people or to be stronger. Um, but um, in horse racing and many other sports competitions, the purpose of doping might be to win at betting. Sometimes it's to win for prize money and sometimes in, for example, athletics, it's just to win. But very often, increasingly, I think in the past several decades, the, the driver of corruption is related to betting. So it's betting to win that is causing corruption problems in sport. And a lot of that betting doesn't come in uh, transparent, open betting markets. It comes in illegal black markets. And, and that's what we've studied um, in Hong Kong with my colleagues there for many years. So studying illegal black markets means studying the people who run them. And this is a key part of organized crime groups because it's a really, really strong revenue stream for organized crime groups. Um, now, that, now that's grown from Asia, especially, and, and there are some uh, social, economic, political reasons from that. So Asia has, without doubt, the biggest illegal betting markets in the world. Um, and if you step back, look at the map, look at the globe, there are some, some clear social, economic, political reasons for that. Uh, China, for example, is a starting point. Um, China's been uh, ruled by the Chinese Communist Party since 1949. Uh, gambling was actually outlawed from 1949. So despite that, there's a preponderance of gambling amongst Chinese people. W without making that ethnically biased, it, it, it's simply factual. And the, the reasons for that may be complex. But um, there are huge illegal gambling markets because of that in China despite the fact there's now a semi-legal market that the government allows to grow quite slowly. Um, and then stepping back again, looking further across Asia, is Islamic or largely Islamic countries such as Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, uh, gambling is almost entirely um, illegal, which means that um, the very, very limited legal opportunities uh, are not enough to satisfy the, the demand in those societies and people go to the black market. Thailand, also another huge illegal market, um, partly religious reasons. I think that the, 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 the Buddhist culture in Thailand uh, generally frowns upon gambling. So it's not a particularly socially acceptable um, activity. And, and hence, it's, uh, it's largely an underground activity as well. And some pretty significant criminal groups in Thailand involved in, in running betting. So that's just a few of the major countries. But think of the populations across those countries and the number of people involved in those black markets, illicit markets, illegal markets, and their spending power. So I'll, I'll just give one, one more point to this introduction, if I may, Khalil, just to, um, to come on from that. So looking at spending power in Asia from, let's say, 1980 uh, up until the present day, and what's happened with economies in Asia from 1980, what's happened to, to wealth generation, what's happened to spending power. So in 1980, China was an extremely poor, poor country. Uh, so for example, GDP per capita in China in 1980 was around 190 US dollars. In 1990, it was around 300 US dollars. And in 2000, it was around 900 US dollars. By 2021, uh, sorry, sorry, 2000, it was around 900 US dollars. 2021, it was over 12,000 US dollars. So that's huge economic growth in a relatively short space of time. Um, and that economic growth and that wealth creation is, has obviously been um, mirrored across many other countries in Asia through this, this economic miracle in the past um, four decades. So economies have grown, wealth has grown, GDP per capita has grown. Um, and at the same time in parallel, in the past three decades, internet connectivity has grown across Asia. And with that, certainly in the last two decades, mobile internet connectivity. So you have a lot of people, young populations, new spending power connected to the internet, mobile, and interested in sports and able to watch sports on TV, hence the popularity of 
uh, European soccer, Premier League games in Britain, La Liga in, in uh, Italy, etc. So you have this huge Asian population, newly uh, wealthy in a sort of middle class way, um, wanting to spend money, interested in sports, and like many people wanting to bet on sports with very limited legal opportunities. So suddenly we have this huge set of illegal betting markets over the last two decades. And that is a particularly strong revenue stream for organized crime groups, which have gone from locally based, involved in betting and gambling, say in Hong Kong or Macau or Southern China or the Philippines, Malaysia, uh, especially, um, to sort of sub-regional based and on a localized area, Southern China, Hong Kong, Macau, um, or Southeast Asia to a Asia regional base. And, and many of those groups now becoming global groups with this huge revenue stream from online illegal black market betting. Um, so, so I hope that sort of sets the scene for what illegal betting is, why it's, why it's grown and why it's really important because it's a massive revenue stream. Um, yeah, John can go on to this in a moment as well, because it's his speciality, but it's such a strong revenue stream. You make a great deal more money running illegal gambling than you do selling drugs. And it's a lot less risk if you're a criminal. So um, that's why that's why criminal groups like this business line. Um, I hope that's a useful introduction, Cleo. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful, Martin. Um, and particularly for someone like myself, who's, you know, been based in North America his whole life and, you know, hears about these deep liquidity pools for betting in Asia offshore and um, doesn't really have the context for how that came to be the case. Um, Tom, I, I, you know, I recognize that you're actually based in Hong Kong right now, um, you know, based on the fact that we had to get you up for a 6 a.m. webinar. So thank you for, for getting up so early with us to join us on the seminar. I was wondering if, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit more about the types of issue that you're focused on um, these days. And if I can throw in like an extra request there, could you just tell me what CityBet is and, and why it's such a big deal? Yeah, absolutely. Well, good morning from Hong Kong. Um, and um, yeah, so just, just uh, I'll provide a little bit of background about my area. Uh, um, I, think, I think Martin's comes really really wide ranging and ex excellent points there. So uh, there's no doubt we've got plenty to discuss on this webinar. Um, my, uh, my background, I've been working in uh, well, sports integrity, betting integrity for almost 20 years now. Um, I, I was fortunate, uh, fortunate uh, enough to get my job through, uh, through some corruption being exposed uh, on British horse racing by the BBC. Um, so back in uh, back in 2003 uh, time, um, 2002, 2003, there was two major investigation programs um, on British horse racing um, by the BBC, which basically exposed that the regulators at the time of British horse racing, who were the UK Jockey Club, when, had not caught up with changes to the betting market and changes to technology and certainly internet betting, which left the industry very exposed to uh, corruption. Um, and mainly this was taking, a place, uh, uh, taking place on uh, betting exchanges, uh, which I'm sure that um, some people will be aware of, those who bet, but, uh, but betting exchange being a customer to customer platform, um, and basically the betting exchange takes no risk. They just take a commission by matching customers' bets, a bit like the stock exchange. So what happened back in, in, in 2003, these really took off in Britain, uh, but the jockey club didn't understand them. Uh, it was hitting, hitting front page uh, news, certainly in, in, in the Racing Post, and certainly making leading sports articles in the national press. So, so it was quite clear there was a major problem and the BBC exposed, exposed that. And then what happened then was a security review. Uh, and it was the first, what came about was the first modern day looking uh, sports integrity unit um, where you had, um, where you had um, um, 
analysts, alongside um, alongside betting analysts, alongside communication analysts, uh, a, a, a highly active intelligence function investigating officers based upon the national uh, policing model in the UK. But right at the core of this was was the problem of betting exchanges um, and trying to make sense as to what was going on on, on the betting exchanges and how to uh, how to proactively monitor and disrupt and investigate uh, corruption. Um, that's manipulation of the of the actual race by the jockeys or trainers themselves to basically bet on their horses to lose. So we're not talking about um, a, a, a bet to win. We're talking about betting on an outcome not to happen because they have inside information that that's not going to happen. Uh, so. It, it's, it's effectively cheating at gambling, it would be described in the UK as. So coming on to your question about city bets, that's very relevant because it's, it's, uh, it, it is regarded as being the largest illegal uh, betting exchange in the, in the way it acts um, across the world. It has a big focus on horse racing, uh, but also other types of racing, trotting, greyhound racing. Um, and... And the size of it is enormous, particularly uh, to, uh, the threat it poses to Hong Kong racing. Um, we turned last last uh, last month. We turned over so the Hong Kong Jockey Club turned over about two hundred fifty million US dollars on one race meeting alone, and the actual turnover on City Bet was very very similar, not far behind that. So we have this huge legal betting market sat next to our own regulated legal market um, and it's absolutely essential that we understand what's happening on on city bet uh, and the rest of the illegal market in order to referee and police uh, horse racing in Hong Kong so it provides a, a huge challenge having Having dealt with the regulated market and a well-regulated market, mainly in the UK and Europe for a long part of my career, we, had, we, we, we were speaking to regulated betting operators on an almost daily basis in, 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 uh, in making inquiries, sharing customer details, uh, when suspicious activity had taken place in order that we could carry out an investigation. With Citibet, there is, there is no picking up the phone to to myself or any other person involved in, in uh, sports regulation to report on suspicious activity. So, with, uh, so if, if, um, our aim is to, is to identify cheating, identify corruption, identify breaches of the rules of racing if they take place. And so we have to give a huge amount of attention in terms of our BEPS monitoring, uh, looking at city bet. And when we see something which could be irregular or suspicious, we do try and act on it in real time by uh, by communication with the uh, with effectively the referees, the the, uh, the stipendary stewards on race day, and they can take action before the event happens by questioning the jockeys or trainers or just going through the tactics that they're planning to employ. Um, so city bet is very very big, mainly across Asia, uh, Hong Kong exceptionally large you've got Singapore and it reaches to Australia as well with a uh, uh, with a market which poses a significant threat to the integrity of Australian horse racing too. Very interesting and so what are the payment rails that um, these illegal operators would use? On city maps uh, yeah, city better, so, you know, comparable organizations. Yeah, I, I mean, the the I think the real difference here in Asia uh, compared to many uh, well-regulated markets is that we are dealing with um, something called an agent network structure, um, and this this basically puts people between the gambler at the bottom and the uh, and the betting operator at the top. Um, so, um, so if you wanted to bet with an illegal betting operator, you wouldn't actually deal directly with the operator itself. You would go through a localized betting agent 
that betting agent might be based in, uh, in Sydney, uh, Melbourne, uh, or, uh, or Hong Kong, uh, depending where you are. That, that agent would open a betting account for you. It, uh, they would also provide a line of credit, uh, which is usually set up on a, uh, on a weekly basis. Um, so that agent is basically your personal account manager. Um, uh, and above that agent, there's, it's very likely, depending on how big you are in terms of um, how much you're investing, there's going to be another agent who supervises that agent. And very often on, uh, there'll be another agent who supervises that agent. So you can actually have two or three lines of agents between the, uh, the gambler uh, and the uh, and the betting operator, which in terms of an investigation, whether you it's law enforcement or a uh, or a or a, or a sports uh, sports authority, it makes it very very challenging to actually get through the audit trail uh, to, to actually really know what what um, what bets have been placed and who is responsible for those bets. And obviously, with uh, if you're dealing with agents, it, it, it's probably of no um, probably not going to be surprising. Uh, it's very difficult to find a reliable agent who actually pays up. Um, having spoken to a number of people who who who, who do bet with um, illegal operators, uh, they've they've lost a lot of money uh, by going through agents who simply run off with their money. Um, so it's certainly one uh, one big negative um, as to uh, why uh, as to what the uh, illegal market provides um, and there's no doubt we'll come on to the illegal market but it, it, there are great benefits to bet with the illegal market you could say that's why people do it uh, because they offer a better odds and they offer uh, a greater variety of sports and betting opportunities but a lot more counterparty risk it sounds like <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I'd say that people ideally would prefer to bet legally because there isn't that risk. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, John, this kind of brings us in, in some ways to um, your area, which I, I know there's a lot that you've covered in, in your work. Um, but I was, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind touching on um, some of the elements of how the movement of money connects to criminality um both through like sort of the betting wagering gambling side but then also through um other illicit practices and i know you've spent some time kind of describing this model so if you wouldn't mind just articulating what you've been working on I, this is not a good question that i'm asking you but i think you understand the <laughs> question that i am asking you <laughs> okay thanks um <laughs> I probably uh, Martin's comments um, you know, set set the scene because you know, Martin's talking about the rise of uh, Asia Pacific um, markets and um, the whole rise of um, disposable income, you know, gambling, and I've been looking at I suppose globalization and and both legal and illegal uh, in the Asia Pacific region for quite a few years. I'm, I'm probably interested mostly interested in this whole idea of illicit financial networks and how almost a systems approach to looking at the whole transnational crime, illicit finance. And I think illegal gambling uh, is a subset of that whole uh, broader situation. So that <clears throat> I suppose to use an example, I published a paper recently on the Australian uh, money laundering uh, in Australian casinos. And <clears throat> We had inquiries in every, virtually every state uh, of Australia, um, looking at the uh, Crown Casino and Star Entertainment, and they came up with similar sorts of issues. Um, unfit to hold a, a, a casino license, uh, probably too big to fail, so they couldn't close them down. But what was, the, all of the inquiries picked up the fact that we were locked into um, Asian transnational crime through uh, the laundering of um, in the high roller or the VIP market. And most of this was linked into um, laundering of illegal drugs, methamphetamines. And if you look at the transnational crime, the drugs were coming from, well, the precursor chemicals are coming from China, being manufactured in uh, Myanmar. 
uh, trafficked across Southeast Asia into Australia. Then the money is laundered through one of the means, it's not the only means, but one of the means was through the casinos, back to Hong Kong. Profits were either then reinvested in other uh, criminal activity or just taken as profits, or they're, they're basically manufacture more precursor chemicals, and so the cycle goes on. So the Australian casinos then fitted into, basically they were the weak link in um, uh, the transnational crime system. So what we had then was a, a system of linking Australian um, uh, market, the illicit drug market, into back into Hong Kong, back into the Asian system. And I think we are locked into a whole variety of illicit markets in the Asia Pacific region. And um, I think from the illegal gambling side, I think what you know um, Tom and Martin have been talking about fits into that you know that broader model of of linkage. You know the illicit financial networks are the are the glue, if you like, that link the the those countries and cities and so forth together. So that trying to get your head around this is, as I'm sure Tom would would know, you know, would be is extremely difficult because, you know, once you go into shell companies, offshore financial markets, it disappears. So that you know, we have very little information. Um, you know, I don't know. You probably might not remember, but the Bangladesh Bank was, uh, there was a cyber heist back in 2016. Um, they tried to get off with the US $1 billion, got off with 81 million, went through Filipino casinos, uh, then in probably into Hong Kong shell uh, companies, disappeared into the offshore market, and then probably went back to, partly back to North Korea and plus the Chinese criminal gangs. So we, but we don't know. You know, we knew, we know that the, the money was, there was 81 million lost, but we don't know where that money went through the international financial system. So that's the problem that we're up against, that we've got a, uh, and also we're struggling to keep, keep up with the changes in technology, changes in deregulation, uh, opportunities are coming up in different countries, and uh, the criminals are much faster than we are in, in moving the money and moving into new opportunities and responding to law enforcement threats. So, you know, if a country becomes uh, too tough for them, they'll move to other opportunities. So we're dealing with this dynamic uh, transnational crime financial system that's constantly changing, and um, we struggle to keep up with that, that whole um, uh, operation. So that's, that's the problem that law enforcement is um, Faced with on a daily basis, and um, you know it's a and, and as um, Martin pointed out, it's a highly profitable area. You know you, you can make a lot of money, and uh, out of um, uh, illegal gambling, um, you're not facing the death penalty as you would be if you get caught trafficking illegal drugs. I might say counterfeit goods are is, is another area which is very good for. Um, uh, profitability and uh, low uh, crime uh, penalties or wildlife trafficking. So the illegal <clears throat> um, crime networks, many of them are uh, operating in multiple uh, crime uh, markets, uh, counterfeit, illegal drugs, human trafficking, uh, illegal gambling. Uh, <clears throat> and it's all, you know, as, as Martin pointed out, there's a huge market in China and other rapidly growing Asian countries for these people to make money in and weakly regulated. So when you're talking about some of the most weakly poor, uh, poor countries, corrupt countries like Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia would be the three that come to mind in particular. And that's where the criminals are, are congregating. And all the UN Office of Drugs and Crime reports, and there's a new report that just come out on the opium market in Myanmar, and it's growing at a rapid rate, again, uh, having uh, had declined. So what we've got are the criminals shifting to weakly regulated countries um, and the <clears throat> different crime markets, including illegal gambling, are, are shifting there as well. So, you know, we've got a, a complex system in operation and we, we, we struggle to keep up with what's going on. So um, if 
if I'm kind of hearing, you know, kind of all three of you in the right way, there's kind of a few related issues that somewhat overlap. Um, and if I can just try to clarify some of this, how, how big of a problem is it um, that um, just illegal gaming or betting operations on its own is affecting, you know, the integrity of our sports? And how much of it is an issue that these illegal operations or these offshore operations um, are connected to larger criminal organizations, um, which you know then be, may be used to launder funds. It's like basically going to be a sort of um, a mixing organization. Um, like, like what's the scale of, of those two issues in, in terms of like how we might think about you know this wider network of criminality? Should I should I take the, the second bit and maybe give Tom the first bit on sport? Would that be OK? Um, because I think I can follow on from what John just said. Uh, there, there's a nice segue there because John mentioned Myanmar. And um, I think Myanmar and other parts of Southeast Asia are, are a hub now, not, not just of illegal gambling, uh, that, that's online illegal gambling, online illegal betting, but of all related criminality and unrelated criminality, I should say. And, and illegal gambling, illegal betting are just business lines for criminal groups. Um, and, and I think as, as John was getting into there, there are some significant criminal groups in Myanmar now who are operating multiple business lines in what are, what are reported to be basically factories. So uh, especially in um, Shan State, um, in Myanmar, which is a pretty lawless area, uh, certainly not controlled by the military government. Um, and obviously, Myanmar is a country in civil war at the moment, so there's there's no legality at all. But in Shan State, certain other border areas in the Golden Triangle, um, th there are enclaves, which are factories for the production of criminal business lines. And those enclaves, which look like factories or big commercial business parks, have um, centers for online casino gambling, online sports betting, online fraud, telephone fraud, uh, online sexual services, live sexual services with a live casino, et cetera. Drug trafficking, because you get tired when, uh, when you play a lot of uh, casino games, you need to stay awake. So think of all those business lines. And if one criminal syndicate or multiple criminal syndicates put them together, suddenly these are huge revenue streams um, and they're being operated from really lawless areas. So there's, there's a very interesting question from uh, one, one of the audience who's asked, um, why not just close them down? Uh, you can't close them down in Myanmar. Um, actually, I think there is only one country that has um, the ability to close them down. And that's, um, that's a close neighbor, the People's Republic of China. Um, and, and there is a, there is a precedent for that. I think going back um, around uh, 10 years, there was a massive piracy problem on the Mekong River. Um, and there was a particularly infamous case when a, a Chinese cargo ship on the Mekong was hijacked. All of the crew were killed in, in pretty brutal fashion, thrown overboard um, and the cargo stolen. Uh, the cargo happened to be a, a large drug shipment um, so it was a pretty complicated case. But the Chinese authorities, that, that was a red line for them. There was just so much piracy, so much um, violent crime against ordinary uh, ship operators on, on the Mekong River. They started running anti-piracy patrols down the Mekong and they did clean it up. Uh, and, and of course, they were in very common joint patrols with, um, with uh, the other uh, national police outfits in the area. But um, I think that's probably the only feasible outlook in Myanmar, for example. China is the only power that might at some point take action. Obviously, there are complex political issues there, but otherwise closing these things down is pretty difficult. Um, one of the audience members has mentioned that uh, the Australian um, Communications and Media Authority has closed down 686 platforms. Not really. It's, um, it's given instructions that they'd be blocked by ISPs in Australia. So that's a very different matter. 
And what happens then, of course, is people just use a VPN to go around the um, the blocking. So so that me, but at least that sends a signal. The Australian authorities send a signal that certain internet sites, whether they be for illegal gambling purposes or, or any other illegal business, um, are illegal. And that's a very important point for consumers to know that they're illegal and they're listed as such, even if you can't really close them down. So closing down these areas of criminality is not impossible, but it's really, really difficult. And it's not what our law enforcement agencies are set up to do. We have national law enforcement agencies. They cooperate with each other on a sort of post box um, basis, sending requests to each other. And um, could you could you arrest this person because we want him back here? And then we'll go for a mutual legal assistance process. But they're national. There is no international law enforcement agency. Interpol is not an international agency. It's it's an international post office for law enforcement agencies, basically. So so closing down international transnational organized crime is really really hard um and then it impacts on sport which i think tom might have something to say about as well in, in answer to your question yes yeah so um just just with the illegal market and and, and the threat to uh to uh, sports integrity um, firstly, the, as Martin has alluded to, the illegal market is enormous and growing. Um, and so in terms of being able to get a bet on, you can get a, you can get vast amount more money uh, in one go uh, through illegal betting operators than you would be able to through regulated um, betting operators. Um, and if you really want to corrupt or go into corrupt a sporting event, if you go through the legal channels, the chances are your bets are going to be picked up by the operator, by the sports, by the sports regulator. So if you have the option of going illegally where there is no reporting function uh, on, uh, on corruption, on cheating, or, you go, uh, or, or, or legally, you would naturally choose the market which is bigger and is not going to report you to the uh, uh, police or this or the sports regulator. And in, in terms of changes and uh, and changes in technology and um, and changes in payment methods, the um, the actual corruptors um, themselves are always, like most criminals, trying to keep one step ahead of the uh, of, of law enforcement and of. Uh, and of the powers of, 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 sports, of, of sports regulators. So the, the actual payment in cryptocurrencies have, have become very important to uh, corruptors globally over the past few years. Um, some, some illegal betting um, operators are now demanding payment only in cryptocurrencies. Um, in the past, payment could have taken weeks now it's done in almost instantly, um, and so and so cryptocurrency has definitely had a uh, ha has enabled and given greater power to global uh, sports corruptors, um, and these guys who we're actually dealing with, um, just going back to how and how they stay ahead of um, of um, of law enforcement and and the regulators. They are, they 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 are very tuned in as to what powers the um, um, the regulators actually have and what they're specifically looking at. So just going back to you know very obvious example, uh, what happened in the early, um, in the early days of that uh, British Horse Racing Integrity Unit. What we saw was we started monitoring one one major legal betting exchange, and as soon as we were getting results, they switched. They switched to other betting exchanges. They lowered the size of their bets. Um, they then, when we had success there, and they knew that we were dealing with those other betting exchanges, they switched again to spread betting companies, financial uh, financial companies who uh, who offer sports markets as well. And then it was cash and trying to trying to keep those bets as small as possible, not to trigger 
uh, any alarms with the operator or, or, with our, or, or with our own bet monitoring. So they are very, very dynamic. And the role of cryptocurrencies have, have, have no doubt been uh, a big tool in their recent armour to, uh, to get money across the globe and also to bet with as well. Um, there's been um, there's been some pretty high profile investigations and some still active, which have involved cryptocurrency uh, bets uh, with cryptocurrency focused betting websites. And it's often these websites which um, which you don't actually uh, where well, they literally have no KYC processes. So uh, you don't need to uh, provide your name. Certainly don't need to provide addresses. Uh, and uh, three months worth, worth of bank uh, history to get an account. They simply don't know who, who, who you are and they're more than happy to take your business. And it's an ideal opportunity to, to, uh, to get, uh, to get um, some bets on which will be flagged on the legal betting market. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, um, I was talking to a reporter today and um, basically talking about the Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act and how it was able to sort of effectively crush online gaming in the United States. Um, but now, because of crypto, we're starting to see that, you know, a lot of the ability to do that is it's kind of going away um, with, like, the emergence of, you know, some, I don't have to name names, but, you know, popular crypto casinos and betting shops. Um, I, I'm wondering... Um, is there anything tactically that we can do about that at this stage? Um, or, or where do you focus your efforts? Yes, uh, just to, um, I'll be very quick on this, but Martin alluded to that, um, that there's um, numerous countries across Asia where gambling is actually illegal. Unfortunately, by making it illegal, it's uh, there is still a huge demand to bet, and the inter and the internet and social media has simply encouraged this by heavy marketing on that. And so, if there's not a competitive legal market, naturally, gamblers and those who are wanting to bet are then looking at these legal market operators. And um, what we've seen in in actually. Uh, um, in horse racing jurisdictions where you can get a bet on legally, um, but the mark, but the but those those uh, those betting uh, betting operators are so heavily regulated, they're not competing on price with the illegal market. They're not competing on what they can offer in terms of betting markets. Some illegal operators will offer thousands of betting markets every single day. But if you're if you're if you're looking at the legal betting market, it's only offering 20 and the prices are much better on the illegal market. It's a real that they are real incentives to uh, to um, uh, for gamblers to bet illegally. And it's it, 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 it's a major problem that if you can't get a bet on and you're not getting a, a fair price and you're not betting on the product that you or the sport that you want to bet on, you are going to look. Uh, at the illegal market. Yeah, so just price and product, basically, is something that looks like the maybe the other two marketing P's also uh, add some value there too, but um, that's, that's really interesting. Um, John, I, I know you focus more on the um, transnational issues that emerge um, from this space, and I'm wondering if and I know you spent some time studying a, a model that's near and dear to my heart, the Vancouver model. Um, if, if you have any learning from a jurisdictional level around what um, can and should be done um, in the policy world, um, both kind of within gaming, but also um, kind of uh, broader policy efforts. Well, I think <clears throat> the uh, Vancouver model picked up <clears throat> what I subsequently sort of looked at as the North American illicit um, finance and transnational crime. So essentially what was happening or is happening is that, um, again, precursor chemicals um, for manufacturing fentanyl and uh, methamphetamines were being shipped from China to Mexico. Um, the drugs were manufactured in Mexico, shipped up to the United States or Vancouver. Um, drugs were sold. Uh, the profits then, the 
you, you basically have a lot of Canadian dollars or US dollars and the drug uh, the Mexicans want the money in pesos or some money in pesos at least, get it back. They can't use the banking system. So the, the, the Chinese money launderers came in and said, you know, have we got an offer for you? And um, they offered a very low cut service to get that those Canadian dollars uh, or uh, US dollars back to the Mexican criminal gangs. You know, it's a complex story, but the, me the mechanisms that they used, but the casinos in Vancouver were one me method. And one of the, the, one thing that was very smart that they did was they recognized the Chinese uh, uh, VIP gamblers, high rollers, who wanted, couldn't get yuan out of China and they wanted to gamble in, in Vancouver casinos. So the, the money launderers offered that money Canadian dollars to those high rollers uh, who, who could then gamble. Um, the, the Chinese put the yuan in the, the um, money launderer's Chinese bank account and they had access to the, um, so the, the drug dealer basically got rid of the money. Um, and <clears throat> either that or they offered the, um, the Chinese uh, wealthy people who wanted to invest in Canadian housing. And that's happened in the US as well. So essentially, you're you're matching supply and demand. I mean, essentially, the the money laundering operations are have got a supply of cash, and they're matching that cash with demand. And um, they were doing that in a very efficient, uh, massive scale. Uh, very difficult to intervene. Um, the Cullen Commission in uh, Vancouver, looking at money laundering in Vancouver, sort of squibbed a lot of the, the key transnational crime issues. Uh, it was disappointing in the sense that they spent a lot of time on who was responsible, you know, which political party was the RCMP responsible, was you know, the British uh, Columbia Lottery Commission Corporation responsible, you know, who was at fault, rather than looking at how the system operates and how do you interrupt that system in, in order to you know, stop it. They <clears throat> did respond to um, Pete German's uh, suggestion that the, uh, the buy-in be cut. So that they, they cut back the buy-in, I think it was 10,000 maximum Canadian dollars per day. And that stopped a lot of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the high rollers operating in, in one casino at least. There are ways in which to get around that. But I think you know, <clears throat> there were some simple things that the uh, the Cullen Commission really, it, it, it was a bit disappointing in overall. Uh, and I think that's part of the problem uh, with the what um, uh, Martin pointed out, I think it was, or Tom, that you know we're dealing with national police authorities or national regulatory authorities who look at their, 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 their little area and can't come to grips with the broader issue of how do those criminal gangs operate on a transnational basis? And the Mexican, the Chinese, and a variety of other criminal gangs are much more effective at operating on a global basis and changing their mode of operation, uh, whether it be illegal gambling or uh, human trafficking or counterfeit goods or whatever, much more rapidly than we're able to um, move. So it's the regulatory model that we've got, the nationally based regulatory model, you know, is failing you know, drastically in, in this area. And we, we saw that with the Australian casino inquiries. We saw it with the Cullen report in, in British Columbia. And it comes up again and again in country after country. So there's very little international cooperation, very little uh, ability to come to grips with the rapidly changing environment. And that's what really where we're up. We are at the moment. <clears throat> so what should we be doing? Well, the, I mean, the, clearly we need to cooperate ahead. more, you know, with the uh, with, with each other. Having said that, it raises all sorts of geopolitical issues, as Martin alluded to, with respect to China and Myanmar. Um, there are complex geopolitical issues at work there, but clearly Southeast Asia, you know, the the whole human trafficking of Southeast Asians into those factories that Martin was talking about is. You know, it, it raised, a lot of the victims, families, are appealing to ASEAN countries to do something about it. 
and do something about the Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos uh, factories that are operating. So clearly, ASEAN, the Southeast Asian countries, need to start to step up and do something about their own citizens who are being trafficked into sweatshop um, and horrible, you know, just organ uh, harvesting and horrible things that are taking place in those Myanmar factories that Martin talked about. So, you know, the, the cooperation can take place on a bilateral basis, but more effectively, it would be ASEAN countries putting pressure on Myanmar, which is a part of ASEAN, to do something about the crime that's taking place. Uh, or that in, in one case, I think just recently, uh, Interpol worked with um, uh, the, the WA, the United WA State Army, which is a criminal gang in its own right, to close down a number of factories in the WA, uh, in, in WA territory in, in Myanmar. So it's, it's virtually working with, you know, some of the criminal gangs to, you know, stop you know, some of this, uh, this export, labor exploitation from taking place. Martin, I saw that you uh, might have wanted to jump into there too. Sure. Yeah. And, and I, I really agree with everything John said there. It's um, there's no easy solutions, but collaboration between national governments and um, national law enforcement agencies is key, uh, which, which is not easy. I mean, John and Tom and I are all part of a, of a think tank that, that looks at this, that the Asian Racing Federation Council. So um, we, we do talk about some of the things that we recommend that governments do. Um, and, and, and we give a model to the government policy uh, departments that we talk to. So over the last uh, half dozen years, we've briefed a lot of um, uh, home affairs ministers or whatever their titles may be in, in those positions in various governments, especially in Asia, um, gambling regulators, law enforcement bodies, partly on, on the nature of that growing international criminal problem around online gambling, um, but also how to um, how to have a joined up approach to it. And Australia is a good example of a country that does have a good joined up approach with um, with legislation, with gambling regulation, with the telecoms uh, providers and ISPs um, also engaged with uh, with the media engaged to, to understand the problem and police and law enforcement agencies engaged. So I think Australia has the best joined up model, but again, it's just a national model. So that national model is important because gambling is a is a global business that transcends borders um, and it's extremely difficult to regulate effectively these days, also extremely difficult to collect tax from. I think tax is the one thing all of our governments are interested in these days because Certainly, unfortunately, my government um, uh, seems to be broke, um, I'm sorry to say, um, but uh, the um, governments want revenue and taxation opportunities are extremely important for them. So tax from gambling is um, is a key issue that they pay attention to. But then again, the follow on from that, as John said, we've reached the stage now where some of these criminal groups are so uh, strong and so entrenched and so wealthy, frankly, as well, that it's very difficult to take out their um, their uh, their core areas if they're in um, lawless states like Myanmar. Then even if you do, they tend to move quickly. Um, so all of these gangs have operated in the Philippines, Malaysia, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar. Uh, Cambodia went for a little bit of a sort of uh, move along period in the past two years under pressure from China to kick out a lot of the uh, Chinese criminal gangs operating online gambling. But probably there are still a lot there, which is what we hear from NGOs operating there. So there's great difficulty with the scale of this criminal problem. Um, and it's no longer just a simple policy matter for governments. Um, so I think it, it's not an intractable problem, but it's but it's still a very difficult problem at the moment. So for um, Tom, I'll ask you this question: for a, a country like, say, South Africa, that um, you know does have legal regulated gambling, um, but is I think the biggest jurisdiction um, as far as city bet goes. Um, what should they be focusing on as far as you know, their efforts in trying to you know, mitigate um, 
their impact on, on some of these wider issues? Like where should they be spending their energy if, if you're a, a regulator or even an operator in, in South Africa? Yeah, so, uh, so actually, uh, whilst City Bet offer uh, South Africa uh, racing, uh, South African racing, it's not the largest uh, City Bet project, uh, product. It's probably, there's no doubt that that's Hong Kong. But with regards to South Africa, uh, un unfortunately, it's, it, it's, it, um, it's a situation where, they, where the legal market uh, is struggling against uh, an illegal market. Um, and as Martin, Martin touched upon, the, that Australian model uh, where you have, so, where you have um, law enforcement as well uh, with a serious interest in integrity, as in sports integrity issues, such as VicPol, um, is an exceptionally good model, uh, world leading compared to uh, most other most other uh, jurisdictions. Um, it's many other countries. If they if they if they're seeing if, if they're seeing low level crime in sport, they, it's a struggle to get the police to be interested because of a lack of resource. Um, and the, uh, the the South African racing authorities aren't in a aren't in their strongest financial position as well. So, like a like a lot of sports across across the world, there isn't that huge uh, investment in integrity. What uh, um, as to what really is required? Um, but if you're doing it locally as well as Australia do, uh, as um, as, uh, as Martin and John have both alluded to, it, it's it, you need to go one step further, um, and and I hate to say it, but a, a lot of countries think they're on top of things because they're looking just inwardly. Um, but there's a huge amount going on, whether it's a, a, on their sport or their other industries uh, uh, offshore, uh, and I I think there is a uh, a lack of understanding. Um, about about well certainly illegal gambling as an example, um, w w which has taken place abroad, which is directly impacting uh, sports, whether it's horse racing, football, or other sports. Uh, and I don't think I don't think that's necessarily understood. And I think it oft often gets put into the too difficult box mm -hmm. when it comes to police investigations. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, um, I see now we're almost up against the hour, and I wish we had the three of you for three hours um, in order to cover all these issues. But uh, nevertheless, thank you so much, uh, Martin, Tom, and John, for joining us on our seminar series uh, this week. It's been uh, really fantastic to talk to you and, and to hear and learn more about uh, these issues from each of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. A huge thank you. And I'll give a quick plug to the Asian Racing Federation's uh, State of Illegal Betting report that, uh, that the panel and myself were also involved in, which is a really good overview if you're interested in a bit more. And that's available from the Asian, Asian Racing Federation's website, the Council of Anti-Illegal Betting. I uh, thank everyone for joining us. Huge thank you to our panellists, of course, to Khalil and to the Brain and Mind Centre and Harrison Shine, who works all his magic behind the scene. We are taking a pause. The length of the pause is going to be a little bit dependent on the viewers. If you have excellent suggestions for panellists, for topics, particularly where we can broadcast uh, early career researchers and emerging research, please get in touch, send us an email, hop online, let us know what content and who you want to see, and we'll be able to put another lineup together. We also might do a few guerrilla warfare style uh, jump-ins. We're chomping at the bit to discuss the, the UK white paper, if and when that is ever released. Uh, there's a few gambling conferences coming up. We might do a little bit of sneaky coverage on. But again, let us know what you want, who you want, and it is just our pleasure to be able to bring this webinar series to everyone. So please, please give us your feedback and let us know what what aspects you love, what you want more of. Thank you uh, for joining us. I have no more seminars until the UK white paper gets released. I think that's that should well, be. We're we're uh, going we're going to hostage it. <laughs> we're, we're 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 on strike until we hear some news. We'll be holding our breath. Uh, absolutely. So uh, thank you everyone for for your continued engagement for following along, and we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Okay.